our next presenter to have Philippa Boo, uh, who is the NCD advisor and leader of chronic conditions at MSF in Switzerland. Uh, and she has previously worked in MSF operations as the medic responsible for interventions in Iraq, for medical interventions, uh, in Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Sudan, and South Sudan. Thank you very much, Philippa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, of, of the burden of disease that MSF is seeing, particularly looking, giving a few examples of um, things that we're seeing. But I'm not going to go into so much detail of the examples of programs. I'll leave that to Kieran in the next session. What I want to really focus on is some of the programmatic challenges that we're facing. So Kweku has given us a nice overview of some of the more political or country level challenges, and I'll look more at the, the programmatic challenges we're facing. So just for those of you who don't really know MSF so well, and also just to set up a bit the discussion of the angle um, that we take and the approach from which we come, MSF is an international medical humanitarian organization, and we deliver emergency aid to people affected by conflict, epidemics, natural disasters, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and exclusion from healthcare. And that's really based on the need of the population. And so I think the, the important thing about this is that we're seeing the need of the population change, both as the demographics, the global um, epidemiology changes, and then also as the, the nature of the, the places in which we intervene has been changing over time, particularly recently. Um, so in 2014, MSF, so just MSF um, works as a, um, has five different operational sections. And in 2014, we were working in, in 62 different countries um, with, with 384 projects. And particularly of interest, 59% of those were in unstable contexts. So that frames a lot of what we do. Some of those are in what we controversially call remote control, but that means we're really used, uh, forced to use we're only able to use just um, staff that we're able to find locally, and so if there's other expertise that we need, it can be more difficult to, to provide it on the spot, and we need to provide that from afar. Um, and then we have a small amount of projects where we provide support um, to different places. You can see that the majority of the projects are in um, African contexts, but a wide variety of other ones, and the Middle East is quite a big one at the moment. Um, out of those, you know, most of our NCD care is provided within primary health care on an outpatient basis. And so we, we had over 8 million consultations in 2014. And you can see that the bulk of those are in African contexts and particularly in conflict-affected um, countries. Most of those down the bottom have significant conflict over um, recent years. So what's the burden that we're seeing in these places? And this is a, a patient leaving a clinic in the Ukraine where we're dealing with a lot of NCD. Well, it depends a bit on the context. So certainly we have a lot of um, variation um, by the, depending on the different types of context. So, so we work in unstable contexts, as I've mentioned, and, and increasingly those are in, in, in places that have, have a high burden of NCD. So the Middle East gets a star because, I mean, Kweku has already given a nice overview of, um, of the challenges and the burden that's faced there, and that's where the bulk of our NCD patients are um, so far. Um, Ukraine being another example. And then we have a number of unstable contexts where there are, you know, lower burden of NCDs, but we're increasingly having our teams needing to create a response for it. And certainly in our primary health care settings, we're not necessarily have been used to, um, you know, having the, the system that's required to manage these diseases. We'll talk a bit about that later. But, but in, in from places like Sudan to, to Kenya to um, working with refugees in Tanzania, um, in all of these places now, our teams are really trying to set up a system to address the particular challenges of the NCDs. Um, and then we have what we call our more stable contexts, where we are for longer periods of time addressing a particular need. And so for NCDs, what's especially relevant is the HIV and TB project, and we'll, Helen will talk a bit about those in the next session. Um, um, also urban slums. So in these settings, we're, we're you know, having particular groups who have um, high risk for NCDs that we're addressing um, amongst the normal projects. Um, and then, you know, importantly, in all of these contexts, I mean, around the world now, globally, there's, you know, the biggest displacement the world has ever seen. So 65 million people, and that we're seeing in many of these different contexts, and that brings particular challenges for, for managing these diseases. So, 
When I look to give a bit of an overview of the pr proportion um, of the burden, in fact, we have from 0.02% in an Ethiopian project to 82% of, of primary health care consultations in our Ukraine context where we're managing non-communicable diseases. So it's a huge variation where we are. And I think you saw in Kweku's presentation, even within the Middle East, and, and it's the same for us, depending on the setting, um, the, the proportion of primary health care that um, is, is taken up by NCDs can vary quite a lot, depending on the acuity of the context. And in some contexts, we've seen that the longer we're there, in fact, the, the increased proportion of um, consultations due to NCDs. Um, so which are the diseases we're managing? Um, and again, we, we've seen in the previous two presentations, certainly what predominates is cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, and then we're also seeing quite a lot of asthma and epilepsy. Um, and, and, and so then sometimes we're dealing with um, diseases like hypothyroidism, sickle cell anemia, chronic renal failure. Um, and when I s the, the diseases I've put is sometimes, it's either because Sometimes we decide we have capacity within our program to manage them, or sometimes because this is a particular issue in the area. Um, cancer, for the most part, is, is really addressed um, related to HIV, so Kaposi sarcoma and um, cervical cancer. And then we deal with some others, rheumatological disorders, chronic liver disease. And, and, and the choice is often depending on certainly the burden of disease, but also the, the um, capacity to respond in a cost-effective um, manner in that setting. And then mental illness I put on its own, and really, I mean, this is something we're seeing in all of our contexts. Often it's dealt with on its own, but we're really starting to look at how we can address this um, in conjunction with chronic disease, because of course it's often, um, you know, co comorbidity with chronic disease. So just to point out as well that the, the, the predominance of diseases varies um, certainly between countries. So for example, as we've seen in the Middle East, it's primarily cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, whereas in, in Tanzania with the Burundi refugees, we have a lot of patients with asthma. Um, we, we do have hypertension. We have children with sickle cell anemia. Um, and then also within the diseases, and so we see some phenotypic sort of variations. So, so whilst, in, again, the Middle East is type 2 diabetes, um, then in, in, in some of the African contexts, we may be seeing um, a, a sort of type 1 or an insulin requiring diabetes, probably related to malnutrition, which manifests quite differently. So this is just an example from one country, and thanks to my colleague from OCBA for this. Um, so 12 different countries ranging from the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa to Central America, um, where they manage a whole variety of um, chronic diseases within primary health care. And you can see the spread of diseases there with, uh, you know, hypertension in most settings would be number one, um, asthma and diabetes quite high, but they're also dealing with a lot of arthrosis and musculoskeletal disorders and sort of some others. Now, in some of our settings, we really try to, um, to specify what we consider part of our chronic disease program. Um, and so in a primary healthcare, you might get a spread like this because you're dealing with whatever comes in. But when you're specifically addressing with a specific system, um, non-communicable diseases, we tend to try and limit, um, limit it. And it tends to be focused on, on the diseases I mentioned previously, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, COPD asthma, epilepsy, and we often include hypothyroidism, which is very feasible to manage in most of our settings. So what's been changing over time? So um, as Craig has already pointed out, there's huge challenges in data, you know, analyzing data for this, because certainly, I mean, traditionally, we've not really been set up to look at, uh, you know, the data related to NCDs within our primary health care. So what I did instead, um, because the data is not so reliable for that, you know, looking over time, was to have a look at um, one of our supply, main MSF supply centers um, that supplies four of the different operational sections. Um, and just to look at the, the orders that have been placed for, for insulin and also for enalapril, so two key drugs for NCDs over time. Now, there, there'd be lots of biases and ways of interpreting this, but I think it still shows quite an interesting trend. And so you can see for the different insulin orders um, that, you know, they, from 2008, quite low numbers of, um, quite low amounts of insulin, um, which slowly increased a little bit over time and then really an exponential increase over the last couple of years. 
But what I looked at as well is not just the amount of insulin that's been ordered, but also the number of projects um, and number of orders that have been placed. And I think this is quite an interesting trend because that's more of a steady increase. So it shows to me two things. You know, one is that um, the number of places that are starting to order and need insulin is increasing, but also within those, the amount that's needed is increasing. So as I said, not, uh, not a good statistical analysis, but an interesting trend. And similarly for Enalapril, you can see also that the, the um, number of projects and orders for that has been increasing, whereas the um, amount of it has increased much more exponentially recently. So as I said, I'm going to focus a lot more on, on the challenges that we face. Um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of classify it into two things. One is the patient challenges and one is the, the more programmatic challenges. Um, and the patient challenges really come down to sort of the vulnerabilities of the patient. So these become challenges both for the patient to manage their disease and for us as an organization to, to help the, to, to, to support the patient with the management of that disease. And, and, and in these settings, there's, you know, it's a very complex pattern and, and very many risk factors. So the, the sort of risk factors around livelihood, meaning of course, in a conflict situation or in a, in a um, displacement situation, you will have um, you know, pressing needs like food and water, and not just access to that, but also suitability of the food and of the shelter to being able to self-manage the disease. And so Kweku already mentioned a bit the lifestyle issues, but certainly um, you know, if patients have very limited access to food, that can be quite challenging, and we've seen that in a number of settings, um, such as um, with, with the refugees in Tanzania, where you know, access to appropriate food to be able to then manage a patient with type 1 insula, uh, diabetes and certainly even to enough food can be quite a challenge. Um, then, of course, loss of livelihood, loss of pensions, income to be able to manage the ongoing requirements of a chronic disease. Um, and the loss of carer and social networks. And this is something that we see quite a bit. Um, for example, I was recently in the Ukraine where we're working with um, people in the buffer zone of the conflict area. It's primarily elderly people who've been left behind, um, the younger people and those who've been able to have already fled. So a lot of elderly people with, with non-communicable diseases who've really lost their social support structure. They don't have people to help them young people or pe who can take them to um, to health to access health care for example and it's also caused a lot of fragmentation within the community so that there's a lot of mistrust within the community and so the whole social network is broken down which makes it very challenging for the population who are suffering from medical illness and we see particular vulnerable groups so so those with disability mental health will be an issue that will come up many times I think today um, there's a lot of multimorbidity associated with NCDs, and these ones are more, more challenging to manage. Um, we see, you know, the last two categories I've already mentioned, the housebound elderly that we see in the Ukraine. And then another context, so in, in Congo, for example, it's young mothers who have, you know, complications due to their diabetes. Um, for example, a, a blind patient I've been told about who's still needing to care for her four children. So there, there can be some great variations in the vulnerable groups that we've seen. And as well as, um, and this really alters their ability to self-care, as I've mentioned, as well as the, the difficulties in trying to provide the right care for them. So in terms of the challenges related to implementations, I'll look you know, at the, the programmatic challenges, the challenges related to the technical delivery of the care, and then the model of care and how we address that. So for the programmatic challenges, the first challenge and, and will is, is that of prioritization. So in these complex contexts, when you're in a conflict situation, when people have issues of livelihood, um, where, you know, what are the most important needs? So the first thing we need to do is assess what those needs are, and that in itself can be a challenge. And traditional methods of assessing the needs in these in humanitarian settings haven't necessarily included looking at the needs or how to look at the needs related to, to non-communicable diseases. Um, and then you need to make some choices and sometimes some difficult choices um, on what are the priorities in that setting. Um, and once those choices have been made, something that, that I think is, is often interesting is then defining the objectives of that. So if you have 
if, if it's clear that non-communicable diseases is something that you need to address, if you're in a conflict situation as an emergency organization, what is your objective in addressing that need? Um, and sometimes that can be a challenge, um, certainly for the people in the field, um, and particularly when we look at the scope of the response. So, so the issue is, you know, how far do we go? Who is it that we admit to the program? Is it those who have complications and are most severe? Is it those who just who need continuity of care? Do we go so far as to screen for patients with hypertension and diabetes? And I can tell you as MSF so far, that is not something that we normally are doing. Um, do we look at preventative measures and how much can you, you know, ignore the important issues of prevention related to these kind of diseases? Um, and and, and what, what is the scope of medication that you provide? Given that this is a broad range of diseases with um, many different um, diseases that you're addressing and medications, um, what is the scope of what you're going to provide? How much does it fit in with what exists in the country? And, and as Kweku has already mentioned, this can vary a lot in different countries. Um, there's not a lot so far in terms of what we've seen of a sort of harmonious uh, list of medications that's used. Um, and so when you go in as a um, humanitarian organization, how much do you try to harmonize that and how much do you try and go in with the essential list that's yours? that you think is important. And then that, that issue of sustainability and continuity of care, which is always one of the huge challenges in any humanitarian setting, but even more so when you're looking at diseases that need continuity of care. And then the challenges of resources, um, and I think Kweku already mentioned this, but, but one of the things is the, the human resources, of course, and so what are the competencies that you need and what are the ones that you have locally? And they may be, very, they may be quite different. Um, do you need particular expertise or do you try and deal with, um, you know, the, the competencies that you find there? And then how do you support that staff from afar or, or on the spot? And for supply, we've already mentioned some of the challenges of the medications, um, but of course, you, you, and, and the issue of it being relevant to the context in which you're working, but as well as that, trying to make sure you have a con continuous supply since one of your objectives is often going to be continuity of care. All right, I have to skip this because <laughs> it's in another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Pablo. So just an issue on the challenge of comorbidity. Okay, so for the model of care, um, so as I mentioned previously, often we're trying to implement um, this care in an in, in integrated manner, so integrated into our primary health care, but our traditional approach to primary health care is not so adapted to a chronic care model. Um, and so with the model of care, the challenge is how do you organize the care, particularly if you're in an emergency setting, if you're in a mobile clinic, you know, going from place to place, how do you actually organize care um, for, for this kind of the chronic care that's needed and how do you adapt that to the type of setting whether that be a, sm a more stable setting whether that be a mobile clinic um, secondary health care and so on um, and then what do you do in terms of the staff roles and so one of the challenges if you don't have exactly the human resources you need or if you have you know a big need to address is this issue of whether you can task shift to nurses um, or to lower levels of staff to provide some of the care um, in the setting um, and then within that, that organization, you need two specific things. And one is the follow-up of patients. And this is what primary health care is not normally ad adapted to. Um, how do you provide follow-up care for patients with a chronic um, condition? Do you, do you trace the patient if, the, if you lose them in the program? Um, what if you're unable to access the, the location? And that has certainly happened to us in a couple of contexts where we've been running a regular clinic and then for security restrictions, we're unable to go for a period of time. So what do you set up in place um, to be able to allow that continuity of care for patients? And what if people are moving? And as we've seen, there's a huge movement of, of population these days. And so you know, how do you address that if, if there's a population that's on the move and, and they're needing this continuity of care? Um, and then the other specificity, um, again, which Kweku has already talked about, is this need for patient education and patient self-management. And this is extremely challenging in, in conflict and humanitarian settings. To find the time, firstly, to give the patient the information they need, to have staff who are competent to give that, or who have the skills rather than competence to, to give that information. 
but also I think you know prioritizing what the education is that you give and so it's always this we, we have this discussion a lot about the challenges around the education w what is the most important thing to, you know if you're in a conflict situation is it really to be you know addressing with patients stopping smoking and changing their diets and exercising or should we prioritize the education and look at things like taking their medication appropriately, keeping themselves safe and knowing you know, the danger signs and symptoms? And so these are really interesting challenges to see how we then address the education in these situations. And of course, the challenge of then making it culturally specific and relevant and, and meaningful to the population with whom you're working. And then lastly, the technical challenges. So I won't dwell too much on, um, as Craig has already talked a lot about the guidelines, and so they are very different in different places. Um, and as we've also, and, and we, we try to really have an evidence-based guidelines, but the problem is there's really not a lot of evidence, as, as we've already heard from humanitarian settings. So it's often a case of trying to adapt existing international guidelines to our context, but then the challenge of having that you know, harmonious guidelines in different, um, between different organizations and, and in with the national guidelines as well. And then with the tools, again, having these adapted to the chronic care model in terms of patient file that enables you to follow up the patient. Data is a, is a huge challenge and that's something we're really working on a lot because, you know, in, in, a, in these kind of, you know, emergency contexts, to be able to collect the right data really does take time and effort, and it's different data that you need for a chronic disease compared to an acute to acute um, conditions because you need to somehow look at the impact and the follow up of patients, um, patient education tools, laboratory, and so this is also a discussion that we have about what you know what are the minimum levels of laboratory requirements, how much do we are we able to do in, in terms of point of care tests, how much do we need to set up a, a bigger level of laboratory, um, and then adapt to the context. Monitoring and evaluation, um, I, I haven't really, in fact data should have been under there, but I, but I haven't put much there because that is a, um, a whole session that we're gonna talk about, in, um, but that's one of the biggest challenges I think that we face. So the challenge of patient education and making it relevant. And then the other challenge, so this is uh, lunchtime at a, um, community, a mobile clinic in the Ukraine where the community provided lunch for us. So you can see straight away if the clinic is providing <coughs> us as our lunch, we're gonna have a huge challenge with the lifestyle education. And this is a little training session we did recently on educating uh, our staff on how to um, teach patients. <coughs> so that's a, a very, very quick summary, that's certainly not all of the challenges that we face and hopefully some of our colleagues can contrib contribute some of these, but these are just when we're looking to implement programs, what are the things we've faced so far? And then in the next session, we'll look a little bit at some of the examples of how we've tried to address some of the challenges and what we've implemented. Um, but as I said already, you know, a lack of evidence on how to go about it is one of the things that really is facing all of us. Um, and so there's a lot of work to try and develop, you know, look at what different different models and different um, technical methodologies we can use to address the challenge of NCDs in humanitarian settings. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. So we'll uh, now move on to some time for uh, questions, uh, including questions of clarification for Philippa if, if there are any. Uh, if we can ask our speakers to come up some stools have been specially prepared uh, for the older amongst us it's all getting a bit Valdunican um, uh, and um, just while we've got a brief gap do people having to sit at the back do you want to are you okay or please come and grab some seats this is a fairly dreadfully designed lecture theatre in the sense of just blocking people from getting seats but you're okay Okay, great. So thank you for the, the three presentations. Um, deep breath time in, ter in terms of uh, enormous range of challenges that have been, been presented here. Um, and thanks, Kweki, for also offering some, uh, some solutions and recommendations for those. And uh, certainly the, the challenge that, that James presented and, and Philippa mentioned as well, 
and also Kweku around the, the lack of evidence and data is, is really one that, that uh, has sort of motivated much of the work for this symposium and, and the work that we're doing with, with MSF in trying to sort of work together on looking at how we can improve uh, evidence uh, on NCDs and NCD responses in humanitarian crises. And, and definitely there'll be more examination and exploration of this in uh, particularly the session uh, this afternoon. So moving on to some questions, uh, should we start with the online audience? Yep, so we have one question from Eva for Philippa. And it's, is the burden of consultations for NCDs in line with the burden of disease for NCDs? And can you comment upon the health literacy of these people on NCDs? So, so I guess in general, to the, for the first question, the answer is um, yes. Um, so certainly in, in kind of the sub-Saharan African context where we see that, you know, there's still large rates of things like malnutrition, like um, infection infections, um, vaccine preventable or ve vector born diseases, um, then the, pro the proportion of, of NCDs that we'll see is, is less. Whereas um, in the Middle East, obviously, there was already a pre-existing high burden of disease. And so that's what we see. In somewhere like Ukraine, again, it's, it is a pre-existing high burden of disease, but it's also further skewed by the fact that some of the population who've been able to leave were the younger and, and more well population who may have been the ones more likely to have infectious disease and so on. Um, will cu come in with those, and what we're seeing is the population left with the chronic conditions. I think there was a second part of that. Any more? Any more online questions? No. John, please. And if you could also just say who you are and yeah. where you're from. I'm John Yudkin, um, retired academic from UCL. Um, I think what I like to do is to suggest that there's not only the burden of disease that should um, uh, prioritize interventions, there's also um, the concept of how much uh, difference an intervention can make, and that's very much to do with the context. Um, for example, the burden of disease for cardiovascular disease is huge, and yet if somebody ha is displaced and has to interrupt taking their statin for a day or a week or a month, uh, they may get a proportionate increase of about point something percent in their cardiovascular mortality. Somebody with type 1 diabetes whose insulin supply or syringes um, are not able to be taken with them on a boat journey across the Mediterranean will die. Uh, so even though the burden of cardiovascular disease is huge, burden of type 1 diabetes is tiny, um, the acute um, case fatality from an interruption of medication uh, is vastly different between those two. So could I suggest, I mean, Philippa addressed this neatly because she was implying there's a sort of matrix that's not only to do with disease burden and the number of consultations, but the acuteness or chronicness and the impact of interrupting medication. Uh, epilepsy, somebody who has it chronically, but if they miss their medication, they uh, have an acute status epilepticus, type 1 diabetes similarly. Um, and what I would then suggest is one needs a sort of matrix for the chronicity of the condition, the prevalence of the disease, the case fatality of an interruption of medication, um, and the programmatic necessity to um, think five and ten years in advance if one's got a chronic situation uh, as in many of the refugee camps um, in uh, Eastern Mediterranean and elsewhere. Thank you, John. Do you have any responses? Yeah, no, I, I just thank you very much for that comment. I think it's a very important point and I, um, and I guess that we, certainly when MSF is looking at, um, you know, intervening in a place, we, we do look at more than just what are the predominant diseases. We look at the added, where the gaps are in terms of treating those, but particularly who are the most vulnerable. And so relating to NCDs, this may be often the ones with, di with type 1 diabetes, for example. And so in contexts where the burden is perhaps lower and where we have many, many other challenges, 
um, such as, for example, in, in, in our project in, in South Sudan. In fact, it's primarily the patients with type 1 diabetes that we manage. Um, and, and as I mentioned, in, in Tanzania with the refugees, we see lots of patients with, with epilepsy. And so, so I think that is a very important point. Um, and I had something else to say that I forgot. <laughs> Okay, we're just going to pass the mic around. Um, we just got there. I'm also just, uh, I'm just going to take a question from, I'm just going to take a question from the online audience yeah. first. So we have one for James as well from Ionis. It's asking if in your review, if you saw any prospective studies comparing TB in people with diabetes versus the general population. Did, did we buy that? I don't think we did. Think certainly so. not that I can remember. Um, no, I mean, we do need to look at the data in a little bit more detail, but certainly from the work we've done so far, there's, there's nothing. Yeah, I don't think so. No. Yeah, there is definitely a difference in the heavens by much. Yeah. 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 Who's going to, who's got the mic? Uh, let's just start with, with Barbara first. Hi, my name is Barbara lopez Cardoso. I'm from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in um, Atlanta. I just want to make a comment. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentations. But I wanted to clarify uh, something about the definition of mental health and how it's included in NCDs or not included, because several of you, um, you know, like um, you know, IMC does seem to include it in NCDs <laughs> and MSF sometimes does, but I think in order to get a better uh, handle on the magnitude of the problem of NCDs, we also need to define better what we really mean with NCDs and if mental health is or is not um, included in it. Uh, of course, you know, the mental health, uh, the global mental health field is a whole field in itself in a way. Um, but it's also very closely related and maybe it's part of NCDs and on the other hand NCDs in terms of you know, hypertension, diabetes also um, very closely related to mental health issues in terms of comorbidity, etc. So I think if we want to get a better idea about the, uh, the prevalence and the magnitude of the problem, first we need to define what we really mean with NCDs and if mental health is or um, is not included. And um, you know, just to throw it out there that I discussed yesterday also with Kieran that I think it would be um, not that difficult to do some better uh, cross-sectional uh, surveys to get a better idea, um, you know, what really the prevalence is. And, and at that point, of course, we can also define if we're going to include mental health in those kinds of surveys. And certainly CDC would be uh, very much willing to, um, you know, assist with that. Yeah. And just... Uh, I I'm glad you raised that point. So from, I think from our perspective in putting this symposium together, we, we were viewing in a sense that mental health is, and psychosocial support is, is slightly separate, uh, only in, in the sense that it is a field unto itself and there's been a lot of work on it, whereas um, there's been less work on, on diabetes, cancers, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and so on. So I think that was part of the logic behind it. But uh, absolutely, that there should be the links between them, the comorbidities, the potential for, for integrated services sh is something that really <laughs> needs to be, to be borne in mind. I know there's some hands coming up here, but I just want to uh, ask the, the panel members if they have any responses on that point. <coughs> yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, very important uh, point on, on that. But as uh, Bea has mentioned, I think uh, from our perspective, uh, international medical perspective, it's more about the integration of the services. Uh, you want to avoid a situation whereby if, if you have a, a health center where you have consultation going on for, um, for some form of NCD, if you like, and the comorbidity that you mentioned, then if you have a, a sort of a separate um, location for, for mental health issues, then it becomes quite a difficult a challenge for, for the client, especially in situations whereby uh, movement is a little bit restricted. So if you have a situation where you can have the, the so-called one-stop shop, like your, your HIV TB approach, for example, whereby it's all integrated. So if you have uh, someone who has got a, a, an issue related to their uh, NCD, which is a, a factor to their, to their mental health or vice versa, then it's, it's easy to, to provide a service in, in an integrated approach. So that's the way we look at it, but certainly, uh, there's a lot of discussion. I think in the NCD group, 
headed by UNHCR, uh, is also being discussed, this particular issue. Uh, I remember the discussion very well. And the fact that mental health has got sort of uh, uh, quite a bit of focus, uh, there's a tendency to try to separate them. Uh, Tamam, do you want to talk? Yes, uh, just on, on this topic, it's... Uh, no, sorry, do you want to just... Tamam, uh, uh, that from MSF. Uh, it's interesting, because what we do now is simplify it and do mental health as if it's a harmonious group of diseases and NCDs as if it's harmonious group of diseases. We end up addressing the NCDs as we talked and mental health go to psychosocial support. What falls in the crack is psychiatric disorders that then very few people acknowledge or address. And this ha we've seen there has been a quite uh, forceful push in some of sections of MSF to just accept that you have uh, mental health conditions that need treatment that is chemical treatment, not psychosocial support, and that get ignored and uh, uh, done off with uh, because they are not included practically in any of the two groups. Thanks for that point. Uh, Kieran, you had a question? of consultation relating to NCDs in, in our programs. And I think this, it raises a concern about, uh, for me about um, um, sort of you, you, you find what you look for to some extent. And, and I think in many settings we work, we know that uh, people are very slow to present with NCDs. In fact, uh, uh, it's not always the case that people would recognize um, uh, a sort of insidious fatigue and, and, and polyuria as a a medical condition per se that they would uh, present to the health authority for, and especially in a context that has not known diabetes uh, is significantly in the past. So I, I, I think it's really just to say that I, I, maybe to, to it's, it's more of a comment um, and a question to the, the panel of, about uh, how how we can address this and, and, in, and do we need to actually rely more on uh, surveys, you know, surveys of disease burden in the context we're working rather than relying on what we're seeing from the mental activities. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on this. Uh, this uh, ties in very well with what the gentleman, uh, what is his name, uh, uh, mentioned. Um, so in, in the situation of uh, displaced population in the uh, humanitarian context, I think we also discussed in the NCD group uh, at some point, is do you sit back passively and wait for clients to get to you or you acti actively seek them. As you mentioned, if you seek, you may find. <laughs> However, um, if you have a contest whereby you know uh, previously that you may have uh, people with epilepsy or you may have uh, clients with type 1 diabetes, etc., and if you sit back and they don't seek care, then your mortality in that particular situation goes, goes up. So there's a fine balance between uh, passively sitting back and actively uh, seeking uh, clients to go out uh, in terms of what is out there, etc., related to uh, what the gentleman said as to the, the level of um, risk and, and vulnerability and mortality if you interrupt treatment. Something that uh, I think it needs to be sort of uh, uh, be part of the, the whole package of NCD care in uh, emergencies. Sure, I mean, not, not much more to add, but it was certainly something we discussed as part of this review, and it's, it's unsurprising that we see a lot of papers that look specifically at hypertension because it's diagnosed with a blood pressure cuff, and it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, I mean, it was, it was also quite surprising that we were seeing a, a, an increase in the number of papers that were looking at cancer, and that raises some interesting questions in terms of what you go, wh where you go with, with that information once you've, you've made a diagnosis. Certainly in the context I worked in most recently, we saw a lot of hypertension and diabetes because it was simple and straightforward to pick up on and then in some ways to treat. Uh, we were treating cardiac disease somewhat presumptively on occasion, and then we were seeing cancer but unable to do anything about it. Yeah, certainly. Um, um, of course, it's, it's absolutely true that you, we find what we look for, and, and, I, and I, it certainly I, I wonder whether the fact that we're starting to have 
more um, requests from some of these kind of sub-Saharan African contexts for how to support patients with NCDs is because there is an increasing awareness of it and they're more likely to do something with the high blood pressure they find than perhaps ignore it in the past. But I guess there is also this issue of the prioritization and so that the question of then what we look for will depend on the priorities and the context and how far we go. And so in some contexts it's been that we don't have the capacity to be sort of screening as such for patients with these diseases, but certainly having our team alert to them and certainly doing training of our teams to make sure that they recognize symptoms um, if they present. And in some situations doing some, some sort of health promotion in the community um, particularly, you know, to, to make people in the population aware of these diseases. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious there's quite a few hands being raised, but let's first go to the online audience. Yep, there's another one for Philippa from Francesca in Italy, and she wanted you to comment a bit about the cost of a project on NCDs in comparison to other projects, so in terms of the team and drugs, and then if we know something about the impact of results of these kind of projects on mortality. So yeah, relating to the costs, I mean certainly a chronic, you know, a chronic disease program brings with it a huge number of um, different costs to what we may have in other settings. For, I mean firstly the cost of the medications is, is one of the big burdens because you're needing to provide patients with usually multiple numbers of drugs on a continuous basis. One, one of the benefits though is that with, with many of these conditions there are generic and cheap, cheaper forms of the drugs available. Insulin though is still an issue and so that's certainly a cost. And with insulin, there's also a lot of extra costs you may not necessarily think about. You need to provide the equipment, you need to provide the glucose monitoring, how far do we go in terms of providing that. And the other cost um, that, it, that is a challenge is, is the, the setup. Um, and that, you know, these patients may take more time to see in consultations. And so you may not, the clinicians may not be able to see as many patients per day because each patient is more complicated. Um, and that you need to think about these other components like like following up patients and like providing education to patients and so that, um, and that brings an extra cost. Um, the, there was another question on the, um, the impact, um, yeah. And, and yeah, so just to add to that, another sure. person wanted to also know about the impact on morbidity as well, so disab long-term disability as well as mortality, just to add. Okay, so, so just very quickly, because we're running a bit short of time, um, as I've said, we've had to sort of look at how we, we collect our data, because definitely what is important is to measure the impact in terms of the morbidity. So we look at certain measures like patients' blood pressure and blood sugar, but we also look at the complications sustained by patients and so on. But that's really a work in progress, and that's something I, I don't have some good figures on, unfortunately, at this stage, but hopefully we'll come. Okay, thank you. We've got loads of questions coming up now. I'm going to take two questions uh, here, um, so if you could, yeah. Uh, just I want to speak, uh, my name is Ali from UNRWA. Just I want to, 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 to mention one of the important challenges facing a humanitarian organization in the field, which is the sustainability of their interventions mm, and the handover of, of cases after they leave. Usually there is an immediate response during a humanitarian crisis that usually become less relevant, less important. Usually the humanitarian organization comes through a project for one or two years. They create dependence of patients. After that, they leave, and those people are left without any care. Thank you. Did you also? Yeah, thank you. Dr. Slama from uh, WHO I'm the NCD focal point for NCD in emergency for our region that cut across uh, 22 countries. So we have th two, th uh, three, grade three countries, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen at the moment where we are facing those problems, plus Libya, plus other countries. But uh, I wanted to link the, the discussion about the burden and the priority uh, uh, element because, uh, of course, I mean, the health information system in emergency settings is different from a traditional health information f system. And from NGOs' perspective, I mean, what you capture, as you mentioned, is sometimes not directly, I mean, the reality on the ground. And there are various providers, as you mentioned as well. More and more we see uh, humanitarian providers asking the Ministry of Health mainly to mainstream the services for a displaced population, and they do it as well. So you have a mixed uh, health system within you, the unit in context. So what you are capturing doesn't say much sometimes mm -hmm. uh, of the, the reality on the ground in terms of service delivery. From a burden perspective, I mean, 
in my region in particular, we have a quarter of the population that have hypertension prevalence. Uh, we have 14% of the population with diabetes. This is one of the highest in, in the highest in, in the world. And the treatment gap is huge. We know that uh, even more than half of the people uh, are not receiving any treatment even if they are diagnosed. Uh, so the purpose here is not to link just the burden, because the burden we know that is there. I have received a lot of proposals in the last three years about conducting studies on the burden and prevalence of those conditions among Syrian refugees. I don't see the sense to that. I mean, the pre-existing condition that we know in Syria, we will find them in those people, I mean, in other neighboring countries. The main issue is what are the priority actions that need to be taken? And what are the subgroup of those patients that need specific attention in terms of minimum standards, like the sphere standards, I mean, recommendation on NCD are, I mean, give some orientation, but they're not specific enough about which group of patients, like those who are already under treatment, and within those who are under treatment, maybe the subgroup of those who might present life-threatening complication if we interrupt suddenly the treatment. And this is a kind of reasoning that we are trying to implement with the I mean, interagency group at the yeah. moment, to come out with some outline of a proposal of a strategy to really uh, prioritize NCD in emergency, because we are trying to mingle everything together. I think, as, as um, uh, Philippe have said, we need a bit to prioritize, and also in terms of settings. I mean, the settings are different if you have implementing partners working with UNHCR, if you have, like in Turkey, the Ministry of Health being directly, I mean, providing care. And uh, situation like Syria, acute emergencies and a more protected situation with displaced population are a bit different in terms of uh, the ability to retreat. Something that I've seen a bit missing from the presentation, in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, for instance, the main determinant is access and conflict-related and direct attacks and all those elements that are protection issues and entitlement, rather than the programmatic area related to NCD. And this is a bit, I mean, one, an important distinction to be made with uh, I mean, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, which are more situation of chronic condition, uh, chronic situation where we have displaced population. Okay, th thank you for those, uh, for those two points. Uh, we, I think we've got about three, three or four questions here. Let's just start with David, just down here. Thanks. I'm Dave Prieto from LSHTM. I wanted to ask about the definition of the diseases. Uh, when you're trying to quantify a disease, I think the first thing is to define what the disease is. And I, I have the impression, I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical person, I'm a statistician. But when, when speaking to, to medics, they say, well, many of these definitions are drawn from countries and settings that are completely different from these, like hypertension or diabetes. So, um, is it really reasonable to use the same definitions to quantify diseases in these settings? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, in, in general, you know, in our guidelines we would use, for example, the fairly standard WHO definitions for diagnosis of diabetes and diagnosis of hypertension, for example. So I in my experience, I haven't seen that to be a big challenge in terms of um, too much difference in the way that they're diagnosed. Um, there may be a challenge in whether people are actually sticking to those, but in terms of the overall concepts, I haven't seen too much of a challenge in that. I don't know, Kweku, if you have a comment. Yeah, for International Medical Corps, um, our default position is try to look at the existing definitions from the countries uh, where we operate. Um, so uh, Lebanon or whichever country, we look at whether those definitions already exist and we try to uh, use and adopt those. If those are not uh, available because of whatever the reason, then the next level will go to the global level WHO definitions, et cetera, um, which most of the time it needs to be uh, sort of uh, adapted to specific context. Um, uh, but certainly they are there. And uh, the, the, I think the biggest challenge or one of the challenges related to that is, is how you, you convey that to, uh, to uh, the staff, especially situations whereby they are not very familiar with those. And related to that is the, uh, the, the flow of, of client care. Uh, looking at preparing my presentation, I realized that, for example, that the flow of client care of, of diabetes, was it in Jordan, was completely different from the one in, I think, Lebanon or, or Iraq, one of those. So these are some of the things, uh, but certainly, this definition is at least from the global level, from the WHO level, is already there. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, D Dave Leon uh, from the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I just, first of all, I, I think um, uh, there's always a tension in these situations between saying uh, 
um, the focus should be on what we do because action must be taken, which obviously is what most people here feel, and I feel action has to be taken. But on the other hand, it is very important that action is taken on the basis of good evidence. Uh, and so the notion that we know what's there and therefore just uh, develop programs, I think is slightly misguided. I think in a number of settings, particularly in sub-Saharan African settings and uh, some settings in the Middle East, we actually don't really know what the burden of NCDs are, even in the stable populations. We really don't know. Uh, there's data out there, but it's very, very, uh, it's very, it's very, very thin. So I think the, going back to the, the first presentation, the importance of surveillance uh, or to objectively try and determine what are the important profiles of disease, N NCDs, communicable diseases in populations is absolutely crucial because that is the basis for then rational planning in terms of what you can anticipate. Having said that, I think some of the remarks that John Yudkin made, I think uh, his idea of a matrix of, what you know, if, if you've got type 1 diabetes, um, you're going to have to have insulin, uh, otherwise you're going to die. For other things, uh, the intervention in an acute setting is, is probably less important. But one thing which has come up and been referred to on a number of occasions, which I think is really central here, is... We, one thing we do know, and it seems I think there's relatively good data on, particularly in emergency settings with refugees, is age profile. Age profile is the key determinant of the balance of disease you're going to find in that population, uh, particularly with respect to NCDs. So, for, for example, uh, according to UNHCR, 3% of Syrian refugees are 60 years or more, which is probably half the, I think uh, the, the latest data I've looked at, 6% of the Syrian population are 60 plus. So this is even a lower fraction than in the, the so the, someone I think said that the young people are moving, younger people are moving out. So, and those younger people who are moving are going to be ones who are relatively healthy and can undertake that uh, trip. So I think there are lots of ways in which we can use just the basic data on age to at least anticipate what the profile is going to be. And uh, so I would really, my intervention is to say, we need better data, we need to interpret it more rigorously. And I think, uh, I, I think the notion that, of course, you'll find it if you look for it, it makes it sound as though it's, it, there's something um, sort of biased going on. I think clearly where services are provided, you're going to get increases in what's, what's apparent, but there are ways of actually doing surveillance which are actually independent of, uh, of, of, of clinics. I think that's going to be dealt with this afternoon. Yeah, thanks, thanks for raising that point, and we will definitely explore a lot of these issues further. I, I'm conscious of time. If we just take a question from the online group. Um, so this one is from someone from MSF France, and they're just asking about some people who are in these settings have already medication from previous doctors, and some of these are outside of the guidelines for MSF. So just wondering if there are any things about updating your uh, guidelines to adapt to these people who would have already been on certain medications that might not be on your protocols. So, so we have a lot of discussion about our medication list, but really we, we try to work with a, an essential drug list um, based on what are the, the key medications so that if patients come on, on medications outside of that, we should have an equivalent that we're able to change them to. Um, and this is certainly a challenge, and it's difficult for people and for patients in, in a, you know, if they've come from a traumatic situation and they're needing to then also confront other change in terms of their medications. Um, but in the end, we need to really have evidence-based and, and sort of cost-effective model, which includes an essential list of drugs, and that's generally how we work. There are some settings in which we need to adapt slightly, um, depending on sort of, for example, the national protocols. And so where we're working according to national protocols and we're purchasing locally, it may mean that we have a few drugs outside of our list. But in general, we stick to quite an essential drug list. Okay, thank you, Philippa. So uh, I think we have we've overrun by five minutes. Uh, I know there's at least three questions that have 
people that have been raising their arms uh, extremely strenuously for the last uh, few minutes. So if you can make the questions, but keep them very brief, please. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on the question of protocols, is there any um, attention being given to try and harmonize protocols across agencies and across the countries? Because there's been quite a bit of that on communicable diseases with cross-border work, so I wondered if there was anything similar for NCDs. And my other question was about um, uh, a follow-up, you know, said how difficult it is to follow up patients when they're moving, etc. So are there any innovations in this field, new things being tried, etc.? It would be interesting to hear. Thank you. Um, so in, in terms of harmonizing, um, I, I, I have some colleagues here who are in, um, from other organizations and we've had a lot of discussion about this, about harmonizing protocols. Um, a lot of us base our guidelines on the WHO PEN guidelines um, and so there are certainly a lot of similarities but I think as time goes on there is a lot more coordination between organizations and, and this will be something we move towards um, relatively soon. Um, in terms of the innovations and um, f following up patients, um, there are a few things that have been tried. I personally um, can't give you any detail on some examples, but there has been some work with, um, for example, all the, the migrants moving into Europe and in terms of looking at different things in terms of apps and technology to be able to um, have patients have patient-held records um, to be able to follow them. But I think there's still a huge amount of work that can be done on that. Um, I think that's a whole interesting field to explore. Uh, yeah, so on the issue of protocols, I think uh, probably the gentleman will, will have a, a comment. Uh, uh, I mentioned there is a group led by UNHCR um, uh, for NCDs, and this is one of the things that has been discussed over and over again. And uh, the, the last uh, I, I heard, there was an uh, uh, attempt to try to uh, harmonize the, the protocols based on the existing uh, pen uh, to adapt it to, to humanitarian situations. So, yeah, uh, hopefully, I don't know where that is because uh, the last time I attended a meeting with that group was sometime last year. Uh, so if there's any update on that, that would be good to hear. Uh, but certainly that has been recognized and there's, there's effort to try to address it. Um, with, with the continuity of care and follow-up, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. If you look at the displacement and fluidity of the situation, at least for, for the Middle East, is, is hugely uh, an issue. As for those uh, who are relatively uh, stable or not moving that much in the camps, it's, it's, it's a little bit easy to follow up through the peer support groups and, and the outreach services through the uh, community as well as that we, we, we use. Beyond that, if somebody moves from uh, uh, Camp A or from Turkey to, to Europe or from uh, Northern Syria to Cyprus, etc. I mean, you try to give them records of the medicines they are on, et cetera, so that the next point they get to, they'll be able to assess those medicines. But uh, it's, it's really, really difficult at this stage to have a, a grasp on the continuity of care if people move. Okay, thank you. Uh, our final question, gentlemen at the back. Thank you. Um, another quick question about prioritization, something picking up on something a couple of people have touched on particularly for end-stage disease, complex um, sort of re treatment requiring diseases like cancers, uh, renal failure as well, people who require dialysis. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about how that fits into your discussions around prioritization, the way in which you guys have been able to manage that, if at all, in the field, um, and practically what's being done for people who have, for instance, end-stage renal failure and need access to dialysis, but find that practically very difficult to get access to. So, yeah, I mean, so the prioritization is always a very complex issue and, and it depends not just on the burden but at the vulnerabilities and where we can particularly have added value. So in some circumstances it's providing general primary health care but there have been examples where we felt that we can really have a concrete impact and particular added value on, on some of those more complex things. So, so we have some specific examples where we have supported dialysis services. So Ukraine and Yemen being two recent um, places where... Um, we've also provided primary health care or emergency care, but there's a very concrete need, often with an existing service that needs our support, and then, and then dialysis has been something. Um, there is one project where um, 
sort of a more invasive cardiovascular disease management is is provided um, as a specific example. So, so, so it's certainly something that we're open to, and it, and it's and it's a I mean it's a very complex algorithm of looking at the needs and the added value, but 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 they can be life saving examples, and so that we do we have at times um, addressed those. And a very pertinent question too, because we happen to have a video, uh, an MSF video. I'm assuming, certainly not an LSHM one, uh, on dialysis. Uh, and, and that's being shown at lunchtime. So um, thank you for your attention. Apologies not to be able to get all the questions in, particularly for the online audience, but stick with us. We do have all day uh, to ask lots of questions. Um, so uh, the next session starts promptly at 11.15. Tea and coffee are served right downstairs. Can the speakers the, for the next session please come to the front now? Uh, and it just leaves me to thank uh, our panel members. Thank you. <laughs>